Bennünket, illetve jobban értsük egymást. Hogyan érti a kormány a 23-as évet? To understand the other, how do we assess 2023? 2023 Magyarország kívül tartani, kimaradni ebből, a terrorfenyegés terrorfenyegés esetében, amely felerősödött Európában, azt mindenképpen távol tartani Magyarországtól, a migráció esetében megfékezni, az utána esetében azt letörni, és Brüsszel esetében pedig megegyezni, to come to an agreement despite the constant, constant problems that are being raised. What we are seeing for sure, inflation, war and migration and terror wise, I believe we have been successful. Everything that we have set for ourselves as objectives, we have managed to achieve those. Um, the, not only the government, but there was also a great struggle for the Hungarian families. The war brought along sanctions, sanctions brought energy price increases, and that threatened the value of uh, pensions and salaries. We have managed to uh, defend or protect uh, the value of the uh, pensions. We are waiting still for December figures. We have managed to improve perhaps the protection of salaries. Mid-year there was about a 4-5% real uh, value decrease of the salaries, but will be going down the 1%. Hopefully, and for 2024, instead of the great struggles, we want families again to be the focus point of our politics, policies in 2023. We uh, were working, and people in Hungary were working to not lose what they have uh, managed to get. 20 2024, we hope to be working, the whole country hopes to be working for progress, including the families. What the government can do to this end has already been uh, announced. The new housing program is such, the CHOP Plus uh, hopefully will uh, mean progress, the possibility of progress for several tens of uh, thousands of families. We have uh, announced the agreement on the minimal wage, 10-15% minimal wage increase. The value of pensions will be guaranteed and because inflation a month ago uh, for 2024 was estimated to be higher than it's going to be. So beyond protecting, defending the values of the pensions, we might even foresee an increase. And if conditions are met and we are very close to that, uh, we can also launch a program, a three-year program of wage increase for teachers and for kindergarten teachers. What the political objectives for 2024 and the focus point will be the European Parliament elections. Well, you know our uh, uncensored opinion on what is happening in Brussels, or what is taking place in Brussels. Brussels, I have come to the conviction, and there is a quite a general opinion here in Hungary, that in Brussels, bureaucrats are living in a bubble, 
Brussels is blind uh, to the real life, uh, has disengaged itself from all the problems that not only Hungary, but in fact uh, people are dealing all over within Europe. So the uh, election has the target of opening the eyes uh, of the people in Europe and of uh, uh, ultimately being able to rectify the executive's mistakes committed in 2023. So 2023 was all about struggles, 2024 is about great plans, and uh, of course the year of the European Parliament election, where we are hoping to achieve significant political change in Brussels. That's how we look on the year. If you are interested in details, I am at your disposal. Let's start MTVA, Hungarian Television. Renata Kucsa from M1. First, uh, to do with migration, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, yesterday Tamás Deutsch said that the latest decision by Brussels is again yet another harsh step to force uh, the migration back through and that Brussels bureaucrats are being, becoming more and more radical in forcing their migration policy on the member states. Well, situation, things are not... Uh, uh, in good shape. Um, the member states, the qualified majority uh, of member states has adopted a package that we will just call the migration package. And the whole tenant basic uh, point of reference for this package is wrong. We have had a huge uh, debate about this. I have spent long hours trying to explain, seemingly without success, to other, explain to other prime ministers that the whole point of depart of this package is wrong. Because there is one way, and I can talk to you about from experience, it, from the eight years of struggle of Hungary against migration, there's one way to stop migration, one single way. If we make the decision, whoever wants to enter into the territory of the European Union will have to stay outside of the EU until the decision on their case is made. Every other solution is just a patch. It's not going to yield. Uh, the desired results. So as long as the EU does not resolve, like we did, we said if anybody coming here on any uh, legal basis, even asking for asylum, first they have to submit their petition. Uh, they have to wait outside of the borders of the country, and if the de decision is to reject, is rejected, then they have to stay there. So until the EU does not assume this kind of stance, uh, whatever package they will adopt, it is going to fail. This migration package that they have adopted yesterday, and I think entered into force as well, I can tell you for sure is going to be a failure. This is uh, what has happened. And, uh, uh, so I am convinced that the Hungarian regulation is not something that, the, that Brussels should actually litigate uh, against. Uh, we are actually under the procedure. The European Commission has taken us to the European Court uh, to lift, uh, to end this Hungarian regulation, when in fact this is the single viable functioning regulation in Europe. That's why we're not happy about the decision yesterday. Mr. Prime Minister, what is your opinion about what happened on the, in the Polish public television? Former Prime Minister Morawiecki said that this decision is a, goes against uh, the rule of law that uh, the uh, leaders of the public television have been relieved. Can such a thing happen in a rule of law? It seems yes, it can. We do not want to interfere into the uh, dealings and the situation in Poland. Every Polish is our friend, uh, even those Poles who do not consider us their friends. It is a long-standing historic community that we share. We see what is happening in the debate that is uh, unfolding there, but this is not limited to Poland. If you look at it at a wider angle uh, on the horizon, you will see strange things happening in the Western democratic world. I do not 
not want to comment on these one by one. I do not want to generate conflicts with any other countries. But still, I mean, we, we do have to remark that there are big uh, exemplary Western European democracies where one of the most uh, probable candidates uh, is actually set to uh, be tackled so that he doesn't win the elections. The other country on the other side of the ocean, it's possible that a party with substantial Substantial political representation is under a uh, continuous observation uh, surveillance by the National Security Services. And then we see now this happening in uh, the television of the Pol Poland. So this is some kind of strange uh, ailment that is happening, where if the same thing happened in Hungary, most probably NATO troops would have intervened. So there comes actually, of course, double standards, uh, the issue of double standards. So I think we need, uh, there is going to be a lot on our plates for the future of Western style democracy. Reuters. Thank you very much, Gergely Sakács from Reuters. February EU summit. What do you want to achieve, Mr. Prime Minister? How are you uh, ready uh, to... Uh, yield in exchange for the EU uh, support or finances. What is the minimum that you want to achieve in, at the February summit? If I want to look at it analytically at the next summit, then we can separate at least two sets of questions, which in the political debate, as I'm seeing, uh, have been mixed, uh, fueled by some interest. But if uh, your question was an analytic question, then let us look at the two issues as two separate distinct issues. You have the one question that you started with. Do we, and if yes, how much are we going to give financial assistance to Ukraine? 26 member states, or let's say the Commission, has the proposal that we should give 50 billion euros. 50 billion euros, we should give it to them for four years. The EU is also saying this money is not there yet. We are actually uh, offering promising money that is not there yet, so we have to generate this money in some way. The Commission is saying, let us basically take out a loan together. Let's take out the loan together and give the money to Ukraine. And the Commission is also saying that if we finance this from a loan, let us put this into the budget, the seven-year budget, and let us give it to the Ukrainians through the seven-year budget. And the Hungarian position on this is that if we want to give money to Ukraine, first of all, let's not give it for five years. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in a quarter of a year, not five years from now. So we need to set some kind of a rational deadline, time frame. The extent of the money should be defined based on how much the U.S. is ready to undertake from the burden of supporting Ukraine. The third proposal of Hungary is, even if we were to give such money, this should not in any way be given through the budget of the European Union, because we are looking at an item which is of uncertain size, and it's going to actually destroy our budget. Why should we introduce this money into the budget and then very complicated way disperse it from there instead of coming together and say, okay, everybody should pitch in. Now, let's say with the budget, like we do it, everybody should pitch in the amount of money that they are ready to give outside of the budget. And finally, the fourth problem of Hungarians is that we don't want to take out any loan together with anybody. We've done that mistake once. Back then we had some hopes. It didn't seem to be a mistake back then. Covid crisis, economic crisis, decline. We needed quick fix money. Member states needed that money. There was no money in the budget. So we created this recovery fund, which was fast, rapid, targeted, substantial amounts of money. And of course we took out a loan together. Covid is over. There are several member states who have not a penny. It was not fast, it was not accessible. So we are of the opinion that to take out any loan together with other countries while we are in this continuous political haggle with other peace countries is not a clever thing to do. 
formája, so de a Hungarian Parliament, parliament has this uh, rule, and the Hungarian government is on this position as well. We can give money to anybody, to anywhere where we want to, but we do not want to take out a loan, we do not want to become indebted together with other countries of the EU. Everybody should assume their risks alone. Uh, I would like others to accept this, but there is this other part of the issue as well. This, this was one side of the issue. The other side is that related to the Ukrainian affair, but in a separate way, member states have come up with separate kinds of different way, uh, requirements to amend the budget. If we are amending it for Ukraine, let us amend it for this and for that reason. We have stayed out of this. Hungary said we do not need to amend the EU budget. This budget is good. But if we start such a process, you know, every member state comes up with ideas that are important for them. Well, Hungary will also come up with her ideas, but that is still to come. We will clarify that in the next coming one month. Thank you. Financial Times. Márton Dunai from uh, Financial Times, similar topic uh, for me as well. What Reuters has asked, how do you see the threat of Article 7 procedure being activated against Hungary by other member states? We hear, we see that there is no unanimity among member states on this, but it's possible that if this uh, wrestling struggle goes on, how much of a threat do you think this is, Article 7? Of course, the whole financial uh, argument uh, is related to this as well. I would also like to ask you about this. By all means, Hungary, you yourself have said that all the funds that Hungary is owed uh, should be disbursed, not one part of it, not another part, but everything. For such an agreement, you would want the complete 30 billion to be liberated, or you would just make do with smaller amounts. How much would the smaller amount be? And, of course, also related to this is if you want all the money, uh, the whole conditionality procedure, well, do you want to put that aside as well? And if it, this doesn't happen, if you're not successful, then the 26 member states agree on the Ukrainian money without Hungary, how do you assess the further uh, isolation of Hungary uh, within the European uh, Union? Well, you have uh, brought together quite a package of different, all kinds of different questions. So the first thread is Hungary uh, threatened by Article 7 procedure. It's not threatened. Uh, we are under an Article 7 procedure. I mean, don't threaten somebody with something that you have already put them under. We are under the Article 7 procedure. And another Article 7. So there is one Article 7 procedure, you say, and you think that they would launch another one. Because this one doesn't set the uh, objective of depriving Hungary of any rights, but another one would actually, uh, basically that is set forth in the founding treaties, would set the objective of depriving Hungary of certain rights. The basic treaties prescribe precisely why you can launch such a uh, procedure. If there is a constant threat to the rule of law, the European Commission has said that the, rule of, the threats to the rule of law are over. The Hungarian judiciary system is in order, they have said. So the latest and the best judicial system in the EU is the Hungarian one. We actually have a document to prove it. So it is not we are being pushed towards another Article 7 procedure. No, it's quite becoming quite clear that we, should, we are getting further away from it. The second element to your question 
is the whole money issue. It's important. We do not want to link different kinds of topics that are alien to one another together. We, for example, money given to Ukraine, we do not want to link it to any Hungarian financial issue whatsoever. This would actually go against an EU principle of loyal cooperation, but also would go against uh, to the habits of Hungarian political culture, where we do not want this. We just want to settle issues with the person or with the entity with whom we have the problem. So if you have a problem with the Hungarians, you punish the Hungarian children through their Erasmus program. That is very alien and that is... We do not just do not do that. We do not link things together. If we have a debate and arguments with somebody, we settle it with them. So we can agree with the Ukrainians uh, if, uh, on the Ukrainian issue if the the proposal is a rational one, an intelligent one. We do not want to link it to any other uh, budget issue. Precisely, Hungary is the one who keeps wanting to separate financial issues. We do not want to be linking financial issues together, topics together. Consequently, because Hungary thinks that the budget is good, the EU budget is good, as it is, and if we touch that, it's only going to lead to trouble, we don't want anything, we don't ask anything, we just ask whatever is included in the budget be implemented. The money owed to Hungarians is in the budget, that's why we say that it is owed to us. If they don't want to give it to us, let's discuss. We don't want to include anything in the budget, we don't ask anything, all we ask is that there's a budget implemented. If they start to patch it, amend it here and there, of course there will be a Hungarian interest appear and we will discuss accordingly. Was there something? There is no microphone, so... Financial, the decision uh, on the financial uh, support was made days after the money was liberated for Hungary. You say issues should not be uh, linked, even did, because there are some people who are interested in linking these. Hungarians are not. Hungarians are not interested in linking separate issues. So again, I'd just like to ask this, regardless of money owed to Hungary being liberated, uh, the Hungarian position on money to Ukraine will not change. It doesn't depend on that. It depends on those four considerations that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Can you please ask structured questions, one or two, perhaps per person? And the Prime Minister always uh, responds to these uh, in a concise way. Origo. Jó napot kívánok, Kovács András Origó, köszönöm András, szépen. Kovács Origó, first question, the European Commission in theory has liberated 10.2 billion euros. He said, we will believe it when we see it. Do you think it's feasible that they would withhold it, and Ursula von der Leyen would succumb to the continuous blackmail of the European left? Before I say what I think is conceivable, or imaginable, I think it's worth discussing how blackmail is basically a publicly uh, accepted, a publicly admitted fact. This is not a, a hypothesis that Hungary is being blackmailed. The fact that Hungary is being blackmailed in Brussels is a fact that was admitted by the blackmailers themselves. These are members of the European Parliament who actually uh, say this. Uh, you write this and we read it where name by name members of the European Parliament say that with their name 
we want Hungary to not receive a penny. And even if the Commission was to give a penny to Hungary, they will actually uh, write a letter to have uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, resign from her office. They actually wrote a letter recently, don't dare to give the money to the Hungarians. So it's not, it's the issue is not whether uh, there is Hungary is under pressure or not. It is happening. Of course, what can we do against this? Not much. Not much. Because the European institutional system has at its center point, unfortunately, like it or not, has the Commission. And if the Commission is being blackmailed by the European Parliament, as it's happening, and if they say, if the President of the Commission does not stop the present budget and alongside the money owed to Hungarians being paid to the Hungarians, if she does not block that, we will move, remove you from office. Uh, and while what we're seeing is that not only in comparison with other countries of uh, Europe, Hungary is complying with all rule of law considerations, but when the Commission comes with concrete requirements, we have implemented almost everything that is possible within the Hungarian constitutional system, so we are being cooperative. So my world vision is that we are trying to cooperate with the Commission, while the Commission is being blackmailed by the European Parliament, and the, Council of the, the European Council just puts its hands out and says there's nothing we can do. Well, we have to do what we can to assert our interest. And I will do everything. I will go all the way to assert the interests of Hungary. That is how I can uh, respond in this situation. Bloomberg. Zoltán Simon Bloomberg, at the December EU, before the December EU summit, you said you will by all means block uh, the EU's uh, commencement of uh, accession talks with uh, Ukraine because it's a strategic issue. You also said that the, for the aid to Ukraine, you believe that it could be up for a negotiation. What happened at the summit was quite the opposite. The EU decided after you left the room to commence negotiations with Ukraine on the EU membership and at the same time blocked. You blocked uh, the financial aid. Why did you not leave the room when the financial aid was being discussed, if the strategic issue was that uh, the accession talks with Ukraine should not start. Well, first of all, let us clarify a style, an issue of style. I think to, uh, uh, to a Hungarian uh, minister, uh, prime minister can just walk out of the room, uh, the German and the French uh, uh, executives uh, march out uh, of uh, the room. So I made it possible with this move to Hungary, for Hungary to not agree with the decision, to maintain her position, but the decision to still be made. There are precedents for this in the European Union. This is not the ingenuity of Hungarians. You just need to know how these conflicts can be managed. There have been instances before. This is why we chose the solution. On the proposal of the German Chancellor, what concerns the strategic issue of Ukraine, I tried for eight hours to convince 20 old other countries to not make this mistake. What we are planning to do is a mistake. We should not do it. I tried everything, and I will not. Uh, it was a very exciting, intellectually, I think, very inspiring uh, debate. Uh, of course, there were others involved in it. But it was a very, very, very multifaceted debate. But the way I summarize it is that Hungary does not want uh, to play the role of Cassandra. We don't want to be able to say what is going to happen. But we have experiences. And I tried to say that this was precisely the situation we were in when it came to the migration issue. We had the same people across. We said what was going to happen because we're living here, the southern border, where migration is a reality. We're living here, the Ukrainian border, where the war is a reality. And this seems much more clearer, sharper than from the shores of the Atlantic. 
Therefore, de migration is right, right to, to, to convince them to not make the decisions that led to this quagmire, that they are all in now, and now we have to struggle so that they don't pull us in to this uh, program. So, again, now everybody is against the Hungarians, but you will see the, the one day that this was a bad decision, that will lead to a lot of problems and a lot of energies will have to be mobilized to avert uh, the problems that we are causing now with this decision. I could not convince them. And I have to admit that they had a very, very robust argument. The Ukrainian accession, if that is a problem, we don't know because there is no agreement. Even if the uh, Hungarians maintained their position for several years that this was not good, you still have the Hungarian Parliament's resolution. The Hungarian Parliament resolution is required for Ukraine to join. So if the Hungarians are concerned for because of the Ukrainians joining, we have the possibility to protect ourselves. But there's probably at six other countries who want to make this decision. They rightfully uh, wanted uh, to make sure sure that Hungary doesn't want to protect them from themselves. We don't do that with the children. So we wanted to find, we had to find a solution. The problem was no more that there was going to be a bad decision made. 26 countries persisted, so we couldn't stop them from making it. The issue was, will they, can they force us into this bad decision? And we will also have to take the responsibility for this bad decision. So we had to find a solution. I had to find a solution where Hungary should not partake in any decision that it does not want to and to find a way out. I am, I am grateful to the German Chancellor for raising this uh, idea. We had a short uh, side discussion, we agreed, and the solution was found. And financial, finances, the position is uh, the same. Uh, in terms of the money given to the Ukraine, they want to give it within the budget. Hungary wants to give it outside of the budget. If we don't agree, we have the opportunity to, they have the opportunity to do it outside of the budget. What they cannot do is to do it within the budget without Hungary. What they can do is 26 of them come together and 26 countries take out a loan outside of the budget. And if they do that, we will have our position. And so in February, this is probably what's going to happen. 26 countries will agree on this, but this effectively, uh, this uh, whole Hungarian blocking will be on the sidelines because they will agree without Hungary. So the question is, what has Hungary achieved in reality? And what's the price, again, for going against the tide? Hungary does not have the objective of blocking things. We just want good decisions to be made in Brussels. We just want prime ministers, the council, to make good decisions. We think to just give money to Ukraine from the budget and to threaten other lines of the budget, including Hungarian funds therein, is not a good decision. So let's make a good decision. This is a bad decision. Uh, of course, it's no question that the uh, will of Hungary can be circumvented or certain member states uh, Will can be circumvented on many issues and in some issues not. Uh, it's not possible. Here they also have the possibility to circumvent Hungary. We, we don't have the objective of wanting to say no, always no in Brussels. We want yeses. We want good decisions. It is my conviction to give 50 billion euros to Ukraine for five years ahead from the budget of the European Union, for which there is no funds available, but you have to take out a loan. That's a bad decision. FAZ, Stefan. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, two questions, if I may. First, um, can you give us uh, reasons why Hungary is uh, delaying the NATO access of Sweden in line with Turkey? Is it something like uh, Mr. Erdogan is my friend and ally and I have to stand by him so he will stand by me if I need so? And the second one is for non-Hungarian speakers. What exactly do you mean with saying um, Ukraine is as far from EU accession like Marco from Jerusalem? Is it, does it mean light years or does it mean in the moment it's an illusion and it's a far trip but within a sailor's reach? Thank you. 
there's a lot of discussion from where this, in Hungary, famous saying is coming from. Moko Jerusalem, to far away as Moko from Jerusalem. One of the main explanations is that Moko is a name. It's not the name of the city. It's a name of a, of, a, of a knight who was a crusade knight who tried to go to Jerusalem but find himself somewhere, somewhere else. <laughs> That's what I mean. So if he would like to help Ukraine, we should provide something. We should offer something which is realistic. Membership is not realistic for long, long, long years. Why we do that? If we would like to help really Ukraine, why we use another instrument which could bring closer Knight Moko to Jerusalem, uh, where he would like to go to, uh, like a strategic partnership, which could be immediate, short, uh, consisting of the most important elements for Ukrainians, and to support them in that way, and not through membership, which is, looks like a, a, a nice gesture of, of politics, but in reality does not help the Ukrainians at all. So why the strategic partnership is not more reasonable answer to these challenges than this far away promising of membership, which we all know that will not happen for long, long, long years. So that's, that's what, what I mean. What was the first question, sorry? Okay, NATO um, Bevitesh. <clears throat> The first fact is that there is no Turkish-Hungarian agreement. Uh, I, I sometimes read your articles that there is an agreement between Hungary and Turkey uh, on blocking uh, the membership of uh, NATO membership of Sweden. There is no such agreement. The two countries are making decisions independently on of one another, and the Hungarian National Assembly insists on this. It has been said many times that the government can offer promised dates, but there's one decision, and that's the decision by the National Assembly. When the Hungarian members of parliament see that the time has come, they are not very much in favor of this decision. And I have to say that when the, when the Hungarian parliament approved the Finnish accession to NATO, next day, Finland joined a court case against Hungary at an international court. So you should understand Hungarian MPs as well. BBC. BBC. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the question in English. Uh, so my first question, Prime Minister. Uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has said that he would like a demilitarized and neutral Ukraine. In the past days, you've made clear your differences with EU leaders on the issue of Ukraine. Could you tell us, please, your differences with President Putin or indeed any similarities you have? That would be my first question on the issue of Ukraine as a buffer zone, as a demilitarized and neutral country. Thank you. Okay. May I answer in Hungarian, if you don't mind? Your question actually goes ahead, two steps ahead of where I am currently. I cannot respond to you, and I don't actually want to at this moment, because I just I don't think the conditions are there to talk about the kind of peace agreement that needs to be concluded after the war, because that's what you're discussing, and you cite the Russian president, what he wants. But, uh, if you think that you can first agree on what the outcome of the peace talks should be and then to start the peace talks, you misunderstand the whole nature of politics. I think the correct order would be first ceasefire after independently of any settlement, post-war settlement, to say this is it, this is the moment when we stop the killing, ceasefire. And then we give ourselves time to discuss what kind of peace talks we are going to take, what format and what main issues are going to be discussed there, so to have a negotiation framework. But the ceasefire needs to be respected and could, should be introduced from tomorrow morning onwards. That's as far as we go now in Hungary. Ceasefire as soon as possible. And then the talks. Europe is under one threat here. If Europe is not going to join, not going to start negotiations, in the end, the Russians will agree 
with the Americans leaving Europe out. This is a constant threat since World War II because Europe was occupied from two sides in World War II, from the West and from the East, from the Russian side. And since then, there is this uh, constant reality uh, the threat that the future of Europe, the fate of Europe, will be decided not by Europe, but by two major powers. We managed to avert that threat during the Crimea crisis. I think that was quite a feat when the French president and the German chancellor received the mandate from the European Council. I was there. We gave them the mandate to negotiate with the Russians the Minsk agreement without the Americans. So the question is, if there will be talks, and I'm not going to say what kind of an outcome, who is going to negotiate with who? And if the Europeans are not attentive to this, they will be left out of the talks and the agreement. So that is my approach. Ceasefire, after that negotiation framework, and then comes what you're discussing, which combating party, occupying Russians or uh, the defending Ukrainians uh, will give for a compromise. That is very, very far down. And if we start speculating with the question at the very end of this whole process, it stops us from the first step that should be the ceasefire. I don't want to speculate. I want to concentrate on the ceasefire. It, it, was it was completely clear, but I feel that you have not responded you to my question. of Hungary, which you clearly do, you have a vision of Europe, which you clearly do, surely you have a vision, even before the end of the war in Ukraine, of whether you want a neutral, a neutral country, a buffer zone on your eastern border, or whether you want a fellow NATO EU member on your eastern border. Hungary has no visions about another country. Hungary has visions about herself. What would provide the security and safety of Hungary? So we concentrate on Hungary. And we only go beyond this, uh, the Hungarian state borders. We only go beyond this to the extent that it's important that Russia should not share a border with Hungary. Uh, it's important for the Ukrainians, but that's a separate cup of tea. It's important for us because we are Hungarians, so it is our interest to not share a border. Uh, we are always interested in having some kind of a state entity between Hungary and Russia. This was Ukraine so far. It was good. We didn't want that change. Uh, and changing this was not based on the Hungarian interest. So we are looking at ourselves and we are interested in having an orderly state between Hungary and Russia. Everything else will be decided by the big boys. The Hungarian interest is this much. As a champion of national sovereignty, uh, not only for Hungary but for other nations, if the people of Ukraine want it, the sovereign will of the people of Ukraine is to join the European Union and NATO, why are you as a small and sometimes difficult country placing obstacles in the way of the sovereign will of the Ukrainian people? Thank you. Era kérdése az a válasz, hogy természetesen the response to this is that, of course, sovereignty is an absolute value. But we will not agree to a decision that would pull Hungary into a war. We do not want to belong to an allied, in an allied system with a country which at this moment is waging a bloody war on their eastern borders. Because if that happens, if they join now, that is going to be against the Hungarian interest. It is not the interest of Hungary, of any, having any country in the alliance, which is at this moment engaged in a war because they were attacked. And this is what NATO is saying as well. So this is not uh, you know, a selfish Hungarian position. NATO is saying as well. Hungary is, well, NATO is not going to take steps for Ukraine. NATO is not taking one single step for Ukraine. It is constantly urging its members states to do what they can, but they, as a military alliance, they don't want to do this because they will find themselves in a war with Russia. That's going to be bad for everybody, definitely for the Hungarians, because of our geographical location. So Hungary, therefore, does not want to assume an obligation where there is a nuclear power, uh, and this country is in a war with them, and that Hungary would have an obligation 
hogy holnap reggel Ukraine's NATO membership would mean that according to the NATO Washington Treaty we would have to send soldiers to Ukraine. We don't want to. Breyer, Peter. Peter Breyer. Breyer, Peter Breyer, press heti TV. Breyer, press. A hétvégi EU csúcson szóba került egy Izrael háborúján. When the 26 prime ministers will think like you do about the Jewish state, and that these 26 uh, heads of state and government, do they know that they are the next after Israel? Because terror doesn't know borders. Hát, jó Isten, mikor, kinek, when how God uh, gives uh, people, in what order gives people the light to see, uh, well, I don't know, but there are clearly different positions on Israel and, of course, on the terror attack against Israel. There are markedly different, different opinions. You write about these, so I'm not revealing any secrets to you. I'm not uh, re revealing anything. This is something that the heads of state and government talk about. So Hungary is in a group of not many countries who say, uh, on the basis of this concrete case, that we have a strategic interest in the stability of Israel. So the state of Israel has the right to defend herself and has the right to do everything within its means to not find itself again in a state of being under a terrorist attack. So that is the number one consideration for us. There is only a few member states within the member state uh, within the EU who think like this. Others don't have a strategic. Uh, a vision or strategic decision on Israel. I'll repeat, in that region, there are one or two countries, and Israel among them is prominent among them because it's a democracy as well. The st their stability is an elementary Hungarian security interest, and I think a European elementary security interest, but it is not a realization that everybody has had in the EU. There were great debates, great debates at the council meeting, sometimes uh, uh, even over a single word. Uh, the differences at the end did not increase, but decrease. So it is not completely hopeless that ultimately there is going to be a pan-European position which uh, considers the stability of Israel as Hungary's. Can the Commission give, uh, we've talked about the Ukrainian uh, aid, can the Commission aid a terror organization and not check what the money was spent on from the budget? First, of course, uh, Money sent, it is uh, really a cowardly, sinful mistake to send money to a registered known terrorist organization. We cannot exclude it, but these, uh, there's a lot of uh, shrouded in a lot of uh, secrecy, but we don't have specific knowledge. The second thing that we have to investigate is the money sent to non-terrorist organization, humanitarian, educational, whatever kinds of aid, how much of that ended, if it did, ended up in, on the accounts of terrorist organizations. If it did, then we have to review these uh, structures. After the Slovakian and the Polish elections, what do you think of the V4 uh, cooperation? Are there interests along the line which you can expand your cooperation further? Can you have countries join who are not even members of the European Union, but think alike, uh, like originally the V4 did. If I have one moment, I will tell you why the V4 is an issue of greater significance than what it looks. 
because we only see these debates uh, and arguments within the V4, because that's what the daily press is about. But if you took a higher uh, view of it, if you looked at the V4, you will see a strategic image unfold. The, three, the V4 tries to bring together countries who are between, in between Germany and Russia. So V4 is an, is an endeavor, uh, a, an attempt to realize Central European cooperation. The idea of creating this was to not have the French-German axis decide on everything in Europe, but because we Central Europeans are smaller in comparison to the Western ones, if we come together, uh, if we have a strategic alliance, together we can be the size of Germany or France. If you look at population, if you look at territory, uh, GDP, and I would wager even military might, we are comparable to France and to Germany. And the idea, the original idea, was to actually have it recognized that Central Europe has a weight, has a significance, and a voice. And the French and the Germans should agree and should uh, accept that three major groups of power should decide in Europe. That was the plan originally. Apart from all those who uh, joined, no one else had this interest. Because of uh, individual interests and outside uh, pressure, the thing fell apart. We are now working to put it together back again. We have hopes. Now, during the Czech presidency, during the course of February, finally, there will be a prime ministerial meeting of the V4, where well, we can discuss these strategic issues and we can examine how in these changed circumstances there is any reality of this Central European strategy. That is what would explain the sad, pitiful situation of the V4 currently. AP. Justin Speck from AP. Sovereignty protection law. In the recent times, there were contradictory messages from the government concerning how it will impact the media. Some said it won't at all. Some said, or some mentioned, you also mentioned last Friday in your radio interview, you said you mentioned the media as a factor that could that uh, was involved in these uh, influence attempts coming from abroad. What is your take? Uh, what kind of a situation could you foresee where the media could be basically under this new law sanctioned? Or it is a very, very serious issue, so I don't want to start with a joke, but perhaps not many new know uh, the uh, line from Freud, Freud uh, a lady in her dream is actually running from a monster in her dream. The monster, the monster reaches for her, what do you want from me? Uh, and the monster replies, me? I don't want anything, you're dreaming about me. Nothing has happened yet, and you are talking about the fears. I don't want to talk about that. I have a different approach to this. It is not, I don't live in the world of fears that I generate for myself. What has happened? What has happened in Hungary is that during the last parliamentary elections, otherwise, uh, the actors from the left admitted themselves of receiving several hundreds of millions of dollars on their accounts. It's not about the media, it's about this problem. And we believe that the Hungarian legal system, we thought that the Hungarian legal system can defend Hungary from such influence. And then it turned out that there are backdoors. So we worked on this. We wanted, and now we have this sovereignty protection law, to close these backdoors. Some say that the tax is good for this. Some say that we are causing more problems than we are improving. I'm on the, uh, the opposite opinion. I don't dare to tell you now that this is faultless, it's an airtight solution. We will see. 
we have a regulation that we are trying to enforce. We were not able to find better thoughts than what we have now in the text of the law. We hope to close these back doors. A few months will pass. We will see how it works. Perhaps we might discuss it with you if you have experiences. And if we need to amend it, we will amend it. But we have to start. No one can expect from us. I mean, the voters expect a different, uh, the opposite, to stand there, you know, like, as we say in Hungary, uh, and with hands in our laps, just Watch idea. Yeah, well, things happen. A few hundreds of millions of dollars have been sent here. You cannot expect us to do that. You have to do something. It's impossible. What can we do? We are anti-communist anti fighters. So we look for a solution. We said, how did you have to fight against the communists? Because we believe that the mighty power that we are fighting against Needs, we need to fight with the same uh, methods. When we created Fides, we said we needed to fight in the public domain and with transparency. That's how we said we wanted to topple the communist system. Ultimately, we also managed to send the Russians home, the Soviets home, rather. So this is my, the big power coming from abroad. A lot of money wants to exert influence on Hungary. How do we protect ourselves? Public uh, domain and transparency. So we hope it's going to. This act will serve the cause. If not, give it a chance. Thank you very much. And going back to migration. In the past few months, a few unusual things happened on the Slovakian border with Hungary. The Slovaks closed the border, uh, but not only the Slovaks, the Polish, the Germans as well, because several thousands of migrants started entering Slovakia from Hungary. Az hol így fordul elő, amikor van azért a határa a déli határon? Mi történt a határa? Border fence on the southern border was there some time that it wasn't functioning well? How was it possible that, according to media reports, I I went down the border as well? Practically speaking, this phenomenon has uh, disappeared on the Slovakian-Hungarian border. What happened in that time? What happened with the fence? Uh, how, did, how did they manage to approach the border? I need to correct my previous sentences. Uh, I do not want to make a mistake here. So when I said several hundreds of millions, of, that was not dollars, several hundreds of millions, several millions of dollars, so let's be precise. Several millions of dollars. Migration. We have our border protection system. The state of that, the performance of that is constant. It is what it is. We want it to be 100% proof. Sometimes they manage to cross it. And we have to have law enforcement catch them, take them back. It's a very, very difficult process. Uh, we could not keep the military anymore on the border. The Ukrainian war erupted. The uh, army has to exercise, and border protection is not uh, exercised. So you need to prepare the military, God forbid. Uh, a conflict happens, so the police were left on the borders. The police actually uh, being ordered to go serve on the border meant that public security uh, didn't work well. We wanted to employ about 4,000 people to guard the borders, only 2,000 we managed to. It's about 2 billion euros that we have spent in taking away money. Brussels is not giving us a penny. We have received one, less than 1% 1 uh, of the total cost for border protection. While the migrants are more and more fierce, they have weapons, they are shooting at the border patrols. So we are in a very difficult situation. We are standing our ground. We are trying to stand our ground. The police and the military, well, I can only talk in the highest levels of praise, but sometimes migrants will make their way through. Then we try and catch them. I will not accept any statement that in terms of the quality of border patrol there might have been lapses in the security. It performed in February just as it is performing now. You did not say it, and it's not personal. I, re I read sometimes this uh, 
speculation that we let uh, this border security lapse uh, from time to time because of some uh, secondary interests. That is not true. There is another problem we have. I don't want to discuss this too much. That this border protection is only clo close towards Serbia. A new, a, new, a new development is the Croats have joined Schengen. They have disassembled their fence. Now there is a different kind of uh, border control there. We have huge arguments. We well, we support Romania's Schengen membership. We are not building a fence on the Hungarian-Romanian border. And unfortunately, the Serbian fence can be circumvented. I don't want to discuss this because I don't want to uh, basically. Uh, I don't want. To, I want to help Romania join as soon as possible, and uh, in the end, uh, if they join, we will then have to protect the uh, southern borders of uh, Romania. Of course, some, there are these surges, illegal, illegal, the number of illegal crossings surge. It's perhaps because of the pressure, the waves of people arriving. Because because of people smuggling. Um, well, I would like to just ask everybody to consider the huge effort that thousands of uh, uniformed Hungarians are doing there on the border with their work to ensure to protect not only Hungary but Slovakia and every other European country. So if you want to talk this about this, this issue, let's start by saying that we appreciate what the uniformed people are doing on the border and then discuss why from time to time it's not perfect. Index. Bettina Holló from Index. First question. Originally, you wanted to have the uh, stricter version of the child protection law in front of the parliament by autumn. If this didn't happen, is the draft ready? What kind of uh, changes uh, can be expected? We have our limitations. Uh, we just cannot uh, wage two battles at the same time, sovereignty and then child protection, one after the other, it will come. Second part of the question, do you have precise ideas as to what kind of amendments might be included and when do, will those be introduced to Parliament? Child protection, since the referendum, there has been a working group in Fides and in the parliamentary group of Fides, they have come up with their proposals. There was a political decision on the priorities. Uh, could it be introduced in the next parliamentary session? Sessions. Let's first survive the first one issue, then go with the second issue. Demographic summit of Budapest, you discussed how women with three children would be declared tax-free. This measure was not introduced. When do you plan to introduce it and with what conditions? I have a, a, a steady battle uh, against the financial realities and the finance minister. The the finance minister was very clear about this. You can spend one foreign only once. You cannot launch Choc Plus. You cannot uh, introduce new grants for babies. We need to, he said, prioritize. I said Choc Plus should start first. Uh, the families housing program should start first. I don't want to finish this government cycle without the Hungarian parliament passing a law on tax exemption for women with three children. The, pra the finance minister is standing his ground. What kind of wage increase can teachers expect now that the EU money has, uh, the, has the EU money that was paid give you more room than 10%? I will endeavor to not make a mistake with numbers. Before numbers, there is a legal step required. We need a letter from Brussels, which gives us the mandate to give this price increase, uh, uh, wage increase, rather, that, uh, that Brussels will pay a certain percentage of this uh, wage increase. We have prepared our plan, and this uh, response from Brussels is expected any moment. 
we plan to start a three-year program of wage increase. Uh, the numbers I will be saying, these are on average. So the average uh, salary of uh, teachers, there will be based on performance, based on geography. But in totality, the numbers I'll be citing uh, will be so three step three main chapters for this program 2024 20, January 1 25 January and 26 January 1 24 January 1st so February salaries first 32.32.2 percent increase and then in 25 and 26 something similar, a bit smaller, and I have to tell you where the, somewhere around 800,000 foreigns, that's where their average salary should be at the end. What did you ask Janusz Lazar to uh, represent when it comes to the new skyscraper to be built? Do you think it's important that we should call it Maxi Dubai in Budapest and not Mini Dubai? I am not a godfather. I will leave this to others to baptize it. If Hungarians do something, let's not call it mini. I mean, we are past that. You know, the small Hungarians, they always want to convince us, you know, small, Hung the small Hungarians in small Hungary. If we do something within rationality, in terms of size and quality, it should be maximum. That's why I don't like the expression national minimum. I'm sorry. We need to go for the national maximum always. It's a question of attitude. It's a question of, of uh, instinct. So it's not uh, about the project itself. What concerns the project itself there, we were contacted by a foreign state. The state said, we want to have an agreement with you. This company of this state wants to develop real estate in Hungary in a place which at this now moment is a rust zone. It's a brown zone. Hungary is not using it anyway. Uh, they have money, they have experience, they want to have this huge real estate development. So I gave mandate to Janusz Lazar to clarify this issue. This is a, a process of several steps. Sir, first, we have to have an intergovernmental. Uh, to or eat state-to-state -state agreement with the country. So if we have this agreement, it is uh, a mandate, then we can start preparing the actual content. We can decide, if they want to build something, do we want that? If we want that, do people of Budapest want that? And once we've clarified that then something can happen, this is where we are. We are not far from uh, coming to an intergovernmental, international agreement with this uh, country, which does not decide on what's going to happen there. It's just a mandate for discussion on what's going to happen. And this Dubai, let's forget it, please. I mean, the younger generation seen, I don't know what it, uh, if it's catchy for them. Some people might like that. I think I would be much, we have this Rákos rendező, the name anyway. I cannot uh, allow Index to ask all the questions. Mondiner. If it's government to government uh, negotiations, how are your negotiations on buying Ferihegy Airport? How many players in the discussion at this moment? Again, let's start by stating what we want in reality, what our purpose is, and then some later time we can discuss how we actually ended up being where we are. Uh, there's a huge competition in the world and in Europe as well happening for tourism, for conference tourism, for professional tourism, conferences, international organizations. This is a substantial, substantial weight of the European economy. So everybody wants a part, everybody wants to be in. And in this, 
Aviation is a key issue, and Hungary during the past years has suffered great disadvantages. I'm sure you've seen the airport in Istanbul, you've seen the situation. 20, 30 years ago, Vienna was like Hungary is now. If you go to Poland, you see the Polish, the huge airports that they've built. There's a great competition, and what we're seeing is that Hungary is not only able to keep up, Hungary is not even entered this competition. And we believe that if the state doesn't want to participate, this will not happen. Because you can operate the, Hung the Budapest airport at the level where it's being operated now, but it will never be uh, setting records. So if you want to keep up uh, 10, 11, 11.5% of the GDP in Hungary is from tourism. So we need to have people being able to come, majority of them being foreign tourists. Budapest is a fantastic place, a huge magnet, attraction. And, uh, needs, and it's very, it should be accessible. So we need development. We need to be stronger. And this present framework doesn't provide for that. That's why we need to take steps. That's why we need to agree with the owner. The government doesn't want to say rightly that we could operate an airport. Although we have not tried it, so we cannot exclude the possibility, but we don't have any evidence as to the Hungarian government's ability to operate an airport. So we need a partner that is knowledgeable about this. We have this French partner. They would operate it. They will operate it. And if they can bring in other investors, we are happy for that. Same time, what is the essence is we stick to what we know, the Hungarian government, but we want to ensure that the Hungarian airport, the Budapest airport, can develop in a way that taps into the full potential of tourism and the transaction. We are at the end of it. I think any, any, any of these days the announcement can be made. It is not easy. Of course, all you, there's a whole lot of things to be discussed. Um, the bank, the loans, the loan portfolio, the financial portfolio. So even there is a long, long, uh, basically screening technical financial processes that need to be happening. So I think it's a, I consider this to be a, fait, a, a, a concluded business. I think it's a fait accompli with some technical issues being clarified now. You mentioned an American court ruling about the Trump campaign uh, in uh, Colorado. An independent American court made this decision. Uh, many of those who are against Trump are happy for it, but although many of those are happy who are for Trump, we cannot, of course, have a say in the judicial system of the Americans who are the judges and who make the decisions. It's up to the American people. There is one request we ask. Stop lecturing us. <laughs> Last question. President Zelensky has uh, invited you again uh, for diplomatic talks after the EU summit. Are you going to meet him? Do you plan anything? Have you been invited officially? Well, we found ourselves next to one another at the inauguration of the Argentinian president, and I, and I accepted uh, his invitation to talk. And I said, yes, let's discuss, but what should we discuss? So this is not happening. He said bilateral relations. I said, okay, I am at your disposal. I said to him on bilateral issues, let's have the two foreign ministers prepare the talks and it will happen. He said he wants to talk about EU membership. I said to him, first, settle. The Europe, let's have the European prime ministers settle what you want, and then we will be able to sit down. So we can safely say that he has, uh, he has invited me, and I've accepted that. ATV. Yudikó Csuhaj from RTV, has the government decided on Tuesday that those under 14 and civil servants would be allowed to travel free on public transport? No, but I forgot to mention, when we're talking about the teachers, when we talk about teachers, include the kindergarten teachers as well. And we have decided that they need to be included. And we have not discussed the public transport. No, there is no such decision. 
In 2024, that gas and electricity was given at a uniform price to everybody. This was where the utilities were, utility, utility prices were uh, frozen. We had this ru ru rule introduced where we have a separate rule for those price for those who are above average. So 90% of all consumers fall under uh, the average uh, consumption for, for uh, gas and 75% of all consumers are under the average for electricity. So the Hungarians, the vast majority, are under the average. The price for those above average consumption is the following. All those who are paying above the average for more, they will be paying less for the portion under the average. So it's not that if, some, if you're outside of this average, uh, everybody is in the system until the lev average level and only paying more at the level above. May I add here, we have made it possible for people to leave the system. All those who think that the market price is better, they can just leave the system and then they'll get the gas at the market price. Thank you very much. But when will the government review the possibility of reducing the price of gas above the average consumption? We had to set up a separate ministry. We have known each other for a long time. You know that I don't like too many bureaucrats, too many red tape. I like to have as little as those, but we have to set up a separate ministry because the market is changing so fast, prices are changing so fast, you need to continuously follow that. We do not have any time limitation. The government is continuously monitoring through its minister what is happening, and the majority of decisions are not made with us. It's the energy office, an independent uh, body that decides. What we do is we constantly monitor what is happening and decide whether we need to signal to this energy office that an intervention is required. So, spring, will you have a review next spring? Uh, I cannot tell you when we need to decide with this continuous monitoring, but it's for sure what the Minister Guya said, nobody uh, is offered a bad deal. If you don't like it, you can leave the system now and you can buy your gas and electricity on the market. Nobody is worse off than being on the market. If you believe that you're worse off, you can leave this system and you can just uh, procure your energy energy on the market. We, Janos Lazar, your minister, attacked the Sandor Palace very uh, strongly today, saying that it was cowardice and a communist uh, posture that the president of the republic sent the so-called palace law uh, for constitutional review. This is a very, very unusually harsh uh, word against the President of the Republic. The, regardless of who the President is, the President embodies the uh, unity of the nation. The government will always express their respect uh, to the head of state, is it allowed for members of the government? I said in totality, in totality of the behavior of the Hungarian government is going to be one of respect. Candidates for mayor of Budapest, will you be, will you be nominating a candidate in spring? When? 
The government is not nominating anybody. You are president of Fidesz. At our last presidential meeting, we decided that latest by March, we will name a candidate. We think it's an obligation. We are happy to nominate a candidate. The biggest political force in Budapest is Fidesz and its alliance with the Christian Democratic Party. We might not be at 50 percent and be uh, we will fight to have more than 50%. This is the largest political community. We will fight for it. So there will be a candidate for mayor as well. Was it a coincidence that Orsoya Ferenc was sitting next to you at the Fidesz Congress? Or are the rumors true? She is one of the possible candidates. And also there were other rumors news that David Vitezi might have been one of the potential candidates. Albeit we know uh, politics can be different, is trying to convince him to become a candidate. We all live in this city. This is a one big cafe. This is one big cafe. I can only tell you what the Fidesz Presidium has decided, Fidesz Board has decided, that we will name our candidate uh, in March. Everything beyond that is a cafe rumor. Grapevine, RTL. Köszönöm szépen, Kéri Barna vagyok az RTL-től. Barna Kéri, from RTL. Az előzőekben többször is szó esett az Ukrán-Russian War. Amikor ő találkozott Putyin, mondtál neki azt konkrétan, hogy ön Peking megfogalmazott katonai operációt, hogy ő nem lesz tartalmazott. I asked him, are you ready to start negotiations for a ceasefire? That's the way I talk, especially not with the uh, Russian president, who is the leader of a country. I have asked this question in the appropriate form. Why did you call it a military operation that you just called? Because it's a military operation. There was no, uh, there was basically no casus belli. Uh, when war was not declared, if we start, uh, well, we use it intermittently, uh, interchangeably. We should be happy as long as there is no war, because if there is war, there is general mobilization, and I would not wish anybody for that. So we will continue to call it war or military operation as uh, the guest requires. One year ago I asked you the question, and based on the present data I will ask the question, Eurostat uh, are based on per capita consumption, Hungary is number two after Bulgaria. Per capita GDP, GDP uh, Romania is ahead of us. Do you think that the economic policy is successful of the past 13 years? There are no doubts. There is nobody in Hungary who would say that the Hungarian economy uh, is not in a better state than it was in 2010. I mean, no, there is nobody who would venture to say that in Hungary. How much better could it have been better? Well, the fact that this is a different country with different perspectives, different stability, different capital weight, different salaries, different uh, employment structure, I think that's not a question. I think it would be a foolish debate to discuss whether the Hungarian economy is in a better state than it was in 2010, when from the Jurchain Boynoi socialism we transitioned into this economic era. What concerns data, I suggest you be more cautious. We are not in the same currency, so it's important what you calculate in. Consumption is just part of the life uh, savings, assets, all are important things. It's not just you can just extract something, I'm in the front or in the back. In some other factors, we are very much ahead, but I don't think you can draw great big conclusions. For example, in terms of, uh, so for example, housing or owned housing, we would be ahead of the European Union. So I think all totally, I, in total, I believe the results are quite clear. For me, what is most important in terms of the result is that today there's 4.7 4 million people working in Hungary. That's one million more than we had in 2010. In January, car owners uh, will see the price increase of the petrol 
with the new excise tax. Why are you not increasing the excise? I think it's going to be 41 foreign increase. The Hungarian government doesn't want to increase any tax. We are for the reduction of taxes. I try to take away the tax payment obligations, like for three children, families. We want as many people to be able to keep as much money as possible. It's a general principle. So we want to be remain a government for tax reduction. There are EU regulations which force all sorts of things. There is the thing with the VAT. We have this excise tax. So we need to do that, even if it's against our best conviction. But you could raise it by less. The question, again, is a technical issue. We have to increase because the EU is forcing us. And it's a technical issue of how much we are increasing with. But it's a decision of the Hungarian government, but also in how many steps. And the finance minister came up with this combination. Inflation. We discussed the inflation, the possible inflation in the future. Looking back on 2020, when we were record high in Europe. Can you tell us concretely why Hungary had the highest inflation in Europe? Because Hungary was very exposed to, from the energy price perspective. Hungary was a country, a country who is using energy sources from abroad, and the price of that can be limited in a very, very narrow band. For example, what we did with uh, um, the retail sector. So we are very much exposed to the changes in energy prices. The way you can protect against that is to generate your own energy sources. I think the second greatest achievement beyond the one million new workers in the Hungarian economy is the huge capacity of solar energy that was built in Hungary. We have never had anything even similar. Uh, the last time was, this happened was when POX-1 was commissioned, the POX nuclear plant was commissioned. So we are making great strides towards Hungary being self-sufficient in energy. If we can finish POX-2, the second reactor, at the end of 2030 we will be able to generate about 60% of our electricity from nuclear, 30-35 from solar, and the remaining from fossil, so that is going to be a huge progress. The majority of our money, uh, the funds that are available for this, are taken away by uh, projects that are taking place. It's not only if you talk solar panel, you not only have to build the solar farm, but also the gas uh, plants behind them. We have three major big projects that have been announced. Uh, the public procurement tenders are on the way, international public procurement. So there's, we're in the midst of a huge energy development program. That is the greatest lesson learned from the high inflation. Last year when we asked, you said you were satisfied with the work of the Minister of Interior, Sándor Pinter, who oversees health and education. In the health sector, the depths of hospitals are the highest. Uh, a number of uh, hospital directors were relieved. And after the status law, uh, a high number of teachers left the profession. Are you still satisfied with the work of Sándor Pinter? Uh, satisfaction is not a word I have in my uh, vocabulary. And if the moment I'll be, I'll say I'm satisfied, I will leave my job. Uh, satisfied minister, prime minister is not needed uh, in, to include the Hungarian national team. This satisfaction, that's a condition of, of employment. We have huge, huge, uh, we are behind in, in difficult ways. When we have covered uh, that, the issue is, the question is, is somebody doing a good job? He is doing his job well. Thank you very much. Hear television. Peter Molnar from News Television. Two questions about Hungarians beyond the border. One is uh, the tragedy uh, in Széke uh, The Hungarian government has uh, said that they will do their utmost to uh, help 
kormány a székelyt verhelyi tragédiában. Ez az egyik kérdés, a másik pedig... What can the Hungarian government do for this? And the second one is Transcarpathia. There is a new minority act in Subcarpathia. Odor Hughes Sekujeszk. Valóban a... Gyunáziumi... So the collapse of the uh, secondary school building in uh, Székelyudvarhely, Zsolt Semien was uh, mandated by the Hungarian government to be at their disposal to provide all and every and all assistance to the staff, the students and the school itself if they require more money than what is available locally for reconstruction. And I hope that Zsolt Semien will tell us in more detail. What concerns the act uh, in Transcarpathia, it's important, but I don't want to bore many of you here. For some of you, it might not be as important as it is for the government. But we all, we all know that minority protection is one of the complicated things in global affairs because rules and regulations have uh, nothing, uh, mean nothing if there is no solid practice behind them. We are not moved by tax, texts of law. We have seen enough of these uh, minority protection laws after the First World War in Europe. We are more interested in the practice put behind it. So we are studying the new law and we are in no way wanting to underestimate its value. We proposed another solution to our Ukrainian friends. They took away a, a law that was in place from the Hungarians. In 2015, there was a law that was guaranteeing the rights of the Hungarians. There was an established practice that was working well, that was good for the Hungarians. They were satisfied. And what we are asking is, why don't you just simply reinstate the law that you had in 2015 with the practice that you had? And let's conclude this, finish this issue. Instead, now you are passing a new law, and we'll spend many years discussing whether it works or not in practice. So it would be a better solution. This is what we are representing in Brussels, not only in Transcarpathia. That it would be uh, the rights that have, they have been deprived of in 2015 should just be reinstated, and then the sun will shine again, if not in Donetsk. One more question. Um, let's not leave out the uh, uh, Slovakian, Hungarians and Slovakia. Well, the Hungarian politicians are looking for their domain, their ground. Uh, can you be of assistance to them? Very, I'm treading very cautiously here. There are all kinds of good issues, that sensitivities that impact on good neighborly relations. I think the good point of reference should be that Hungarians in Slovakia are a very, very strong community, strong in number, and they have very good functioning institutions. The one thing they cannot do for a long, long time to assert this strength in their political representation. They have to do that, but it's they who have to do that, and we will not take any step that they don't initiate. So whatever happens uh, will be initiated by them, and we will always pay attention to the excellent Slovakian-Hungarian relations which are quite unprecedentedly good. And that's what I hope, that the present uh, Slovak government will be more attentive to the uh, needs of the Hungarian minorities there than the previous government might have been, ARD. Edit Inotai from ARD. Uh, three questions. Do you expect bilateral meeting with Putin, President Putin? And also to the RTL question, you met with Putin in Beijing and you asked him the question, are you ready to start talks on a ceasefire? What was the response? Well, you can just look at the present situation and you can deduct the response. Uh, there is no intent to negotiate on any side any time soon. Bilateral meeting with Putin? 
hogy közeljövőben None of the parties intend to have such a bilateral meeting. And the European Parliament election, Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned that there is a hope for a right-wing breakthrough. In this case, would you be contemplating in Fidesz to join the identity and democracy We, the negotiations are constantly going on with the European Conservatives, ECR. We are not changing our independent status, independent status before the EP elections. We will see after the elections. What is right? We always want to keep our objectives in front of us. Who with who, which party, these are technical issues. We should not lose sight of the big strategic objective. If you allow me to respond more at length, in Brussels, uh, they are, things are not going well, they are unbearably bad. Uh, European Union was created for peace and welfare. In our borders, there is no peace. It seems the European Union is not able and capable of creating peace on its borders, and it's not only in open war-like situations, but also in resurging conflicts like what you see on the Balkans. At the same time, we wanted prosperity, and the European economy is not being stronger, not increasing, not uh, uh, occupying more and more in the world, but uh, it's going the other way. And by now, it's, it's it's not even strong enough to protect its present state of prosperity. But we have to change. Why are we in this situation? We are in this situation because in Brussels, there's a Brussels elite that was created that we call the mainstream. Mainstream. One side is the left, the other side is the right. But in reality, it is one big uh, group. Before the uh, one branch, uh, as it was said in the Hungarian film, uh, before uh, the witness, uh, they are pulling in one direction, and they are the cause of every problem. We don't have this political competition in European politics anymore uh, at the European institutional level. So we want the, uh, tip, uh, this, this whole party structure that is heading in the wrong direction as well. So with the right that we hope will pick up strength, we want to put enough pressure on the middle, the moderate right, to not look to the left for cooperation, but to look to the right uh, to create a new kind of policy in terms of migration and economy, etc. This, on the basis of this, that you should see who you should cooperate with in order to achieve these objectives. Currently, in terms of initial talks, uh, ice breaking, it's happening with ECR led by the Italian Prime Minister. EU presidency, Hungary is going to be uh, in the rotating presidency of the EU during the second half of the year. What are the priorities? And does the Hungarian government count on strong headwind from Brussels? We base ourselves on what we know. This is not going to be the first time for Hungary. I personally will not do it for the first time in my life. In, I think in 2011 it already happened. Once so, we just don't have to do anything again. We just had to open all the dossiers, how we did it back then, 12 years ago, what were the topics, what was left out, what kind of new topics we need to take over from the Belgian presidency, who will start their work in 1st of January. So there's nothing extraordinary. It's going to be a different role. This is not will be about, you know, here I am, these are the interests of Hungary, let's talk. This is going to be a mediator, arranger, uh, fixer kind of role. I think one that fits us much better, how we can also at the same time assert the national interest, that's a separate cup of tea. That's something that should be discussed by those who are more in touch. Thank you very much, Info Radio. Thank you very much, George Herzog from Info Radio. You have released the head of the hospital uh, direction in Napokban. Hosszú szakmai megbeszéléseket folytattunk szűkebb körben. 
We have had lengthy discussions on the hospital management issue. Again, what is what is the cause of the problem? What is the root problem for a dozen years now? The Hungarian health system is not private and it's not public. It's something, it's a mixture. We are afraid to go in the private direction. We don't want to. That would mean we would have to privatize the social security system, which would not be a good solution, a painful solution for who are not well off. So we want to have the single state social security system. We don't want to go walk down the path of private hospitals. If we don't want this stray system to exist, we need to go towards a state health system. For some, this is a step back. For others, this is a step towards order. I don't want this. Debate. Uh, we are heading for a better regulated state system, which does not, uh, of course, deny public health systems existence. If you want to use public services, private per services you can. We don't want it to be mixed. As usual is with such trade systems, the profit stays with the private system, the costs are left with the public system, and that's not good for the city. So this is what we're trying to clarify. It's very difficult because when you have this kind of mixed stray system, uh, it's very difficult to separate the different threads. The same operation, same time, has different prices in one hospital and the other hospital. You're talking about several thousands of lines. Uh, that's what we're doing now. This is a work that needs to be done faster. That is why we decided to relieve uh, the Director General for Hospital Administration. But we need months, years before we have a well-regulated public system in place. The private health system already sees where they can run, exist in a profitable way, but exist next to the public system, but this takes time. Most important is that this kind of, uh, we, we have basically uh, done away with the possibility of this uh, two systems being mixed, and we are forever grateful to the change Chamber of doctors, medical practitioners, they actually came up with the proposal to do away uh, with the uh, system of uh, gratuity money that was being paid into the pockets. They actually did away with the system that everybody in Hungary said it was impossible because uh, it was built on a less favorable side of human nature. But to break down a system like that is a great achievement, and we need to take similar steps. We are progressing. We need a double a system of double controls, so we need the verification level and the level of hospital directors and a real, true, not budgetary type of monitoring, very strong system of monitoring, financial monitoring on the level of the social security, but the social security system is not built on this logic now. It is functioning like a budget institution that is just dispensing money. We want the social security to define the price of things. We don't know the price of things in the health system. And if we are unable to price things, we'll be not able to settle the account. So we need experts to be able to come up with a mechanism of operation that can be monitored. At the same time, of course, the professional verification and monitoring has to happen. I'm sorry for boring you with these specific policy issues. Daniel Karsai's petition on active euthanasia. Do you think it's an issue of merit? Do you think a referendum can be held on it? Do you think the government could uh, contemplate on reviewing this issue? Let's talk about the legal side of the things. There is an initiative for a referendum from then on. Uh, as a member of parliament or as a government member, I have nothing to do with that. The referendum will decide. But this is not a legal issue. This is also a human issue, and that's why it's so difficult to discuss, because it is, uh, after all, a tragic uh, uh, case, uh, the fate of a human person, of course, especially for, the, for Mr. Karsai, who has brought it to uh, the public's attention. We are with him. 
Sokerült kívánunk. We wish him a lot of strength. We sympathize with him. If he allows me, I will even pray for him to survive these difficult moments. Now that Balázs Fűrjes has become a member of the board of the IOC, what chances do you see for a potential Olympic Games in Central Europe or Hungary? I'd be happy to respond to that. I gave a long interview uh, and I've just seen uh, the, a long interview for Nem in Nemzeti Sport, the national sports paper. I have discussed at length uh, there, I would not want to respond to this. For me, I have more, um, you don't know that, it's not important that you should know. Uh, I don't agree with Balázs Fűrjes in eight out of ten issues. Now that he's in such a high office, I have to meet much more with him and argue with him much more. Telex. Dania Shimor from Telex. Were you serious saying that this was not war? I was serious saying that Russia has not qualified what it's doing as a war. According to uh, the Russian uh, legislation, they need general mobilization. But you've used the word military operation on one single occasion when you sat next to Putin. I'll be happy to use it now, military operation. Sitting next to the aggressor, you didn't, you just, uh, I'm a Hungarian, the Hungarian doesn't uh, adapt uh, only to themselves. Uh, please don't put us into any situation. If the Russians or the uh, Americans or anybody can tell us what we can say. But uh, that is what happened in Beijing. Why didn't you use the word war? Next time I meet him, I'll be happy to use that and you want me to use it. Uh, press reports said that you did not uh, initiate this meeting and you did not have the possibility to uh, cancel this meeting. That's what you said to the President of the European Council and uh, to the NATO Secretary General. Hungary can refuse such meetings. Who initiated this meeting? Uh, there was a coin, the intent coincided. I thought it was natural. If we're there in Beijing, we should meet. I thought it was proper. If the Russians didn't initiate it and our intent would not have coincided, I would have initiated it. There was no problem. I don't act in foreign policy under pressure. I'm sorry. I don't uh, say what I say under pressure. I represent a sovereign Hungarian. State. You said that we should strive for national maximum. I think Lurins Mészáros must have done that. He has been photographed in a new yacht that cost 27 billion forints. Ask the owner. Have you seen this yacht? The Hungarian government does not deal with businessmen, uh, uh, private affairs of businessmen. We deal with economic policy. We make economic policy decisions, and this falls out of the purview. This is owned by a company called uh, Euroleasing, owned by MBH, the Hungarian bank holding, and the Hungarian state at the end. So the Hungarian state also owns this yacht. Well, we should have sold our share of the Hungarian ownership, Kábo and Márton Nagy has not seen the time come yet. We have 30-something percent in that bank. We should sell it as fast as possible. Because of the yacht? No. It's because we don't need it. With the yacht, you said, Gergely Gulyás, smaller yacht and greater humility. You agree? Yes, it's always good to be modest. And why is it that uh, some of the economic players close to the government are not modest enough. We are not the same. Uh, local elections, uh, you have changed, substantially changed uh, the uh, local law in Budapest. Is it not abuse of your power? You always amend the law, always in, in your favor. There is no legislation that forbids you from doing it. When we amended this law, we were not in breach of any legislation. 
az én Where you define, draw the line, is roughly six months before. I think roughly six months before is not a crime to change the law on election. So we can say this is a promise. You will not amend the election law later than six months before. This amendment was not initiated by the government. Fides did not, would not support this. I would, like, I would not want that situation to happen. Can that be a promise? I would like that to evade that. Another luxury issue. You flew to Egypt in May uh, with a military plane. You landed in Italy and you were photographed. Did you fly with the same plane to Italy? Don't make photographs and go into these complicated operations. We always publish where I am and what I do there. there was this a private visit to Italy? According to Hungarian laws, the Hungarian Prime Minister is under continuous security protection. Wherever I go, for whatever reason, I'm continuously under uh, security surveillance. There's one exception. I can relieve myself of this, but I use that. Uh, that's, I take a risk for those who actually uh, are to provide for the security. So when you use the, I will repeat myself, zero round the clock, clock the Hungarian Prime Minister is under continuous security protection from public funds. Yes, everything is financed from public funds, similar to other countries. Every single element of this is regulated and you have to act according to the law. Everything has been regulated. If you ask me 20 times, I'll say that 20 times. But I don't want to take the time from you or from others.